A couple of years ago, some guys from Hopkins looked to see, does your typical doctor know about diabetes testing and management? Guess what? Three quarters of primary care doctors, family practitioners, internists, cardiologists, didn't know how to diagnose prediabetes, let alone manage it. So this is a three-part series which tells you exactly what you need to know about diabetes testing and diagnosis. Take a look. So we're going to talk about if you should be tested for diabetes. And we chose this title because right off the bat, it's like we're disagreeing with Dr. Graf's book on the title because we're saying, yes, you should be tested for diabetes. And if you look at the, uh, Dr. Graf's book, it says, should everyone be tested? Absolutely not. Only those concerned about their future. So that's what we say. If you're on this channel, it's definitely you're concerned about your future. You definitely should be tested for this. So Dr. Kraft on this really simple, really easy read book, it's like a hundred and something pages. Dr. Kraft outlines the history of diabetes and the discovery of insulin and its essays. He relates over almost 15,000 essays that he did between 72 and 1998. And he is a big advocate of the use of the oral glucose tolerance test and insulin survey or insulin response to detect insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and diabetes. And he's one of those first people People who started doing an objective work on promoting the measurement of insulin and considering that for diagnosis of diabetes, not just fasting glucose. And at that time, A1C was not a big thing either. So a brief history on this side, this is something that you can find on the book. Insulin was discovered in 1922 by Banting and McClaw. And in 1975, Dr. Stout identified hyperinsulinemia high levels of insulin with normal glucose tolerance as a cause of arterial damage. And Dr. William Hostler, he was a big person in medicine. He promoted some of the more important teachings on medicine for everybody. He anticipated that in 1892, he started to mention how somebody of 40 years, 50 years might have arteries, somebody with 80 or 90 years just because of inflammation and damage to the artery wall and damage to the vessel because of inflammation. We know that from that time already. Insulin assays or insulin surveys provide critical information even in people with normal glucose levels. And that's the thing. And we saw that last week with sample that we showed how this person had normal fasting glucose levels but had insulin through the roof as well. So that's the thing. The impact of insulin resistance. A quick comment about William Osler. He was the, I think, the head of medicine at Hopkins, the most famous doctor over the past three or four hundred years. He's the one who's got the famous quote. He's in the amphitheater, that oak-lined amphitheater that's so classic for doctors doing grand rounds and a young doctor's presenting a patient. He got impatient as he often did. He jumped up, slammed his hand on the, on the counter and said, doctor, just listen to your patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. And that's been a battle cry for doctors listening, thinking with a prepared mind and talking to the patient as opposed to just getting labs. That's for sure. And if you see the graph to the right real quick, you see how insulin resistance can mediate two mechanisms. One, either inadequate insulin secretion or compensatory hyperinsulinemia is what you see more often. And uh, inadequate insulin secretion, it doesn't mean low insulin. It can be also hyperinsulinemia. And that leads to type 2 diabetes and syndrome X, which is basically metabolic syndrome, high pr blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and that leads to heart disease. So important to mention how fasting insulin has limited value. It's important, but it's not provide you all the information. Fasting insulin is not too different between non-diabetic and diabetic persons. And that happens with fasting glucose as well. So on the book, Dr. Kraft established a normal insulin value between zero and 30. And they mentioned that less than 8% of people with hyperinsulinemia or type 2 diabetes will have fasting values over 30. We do recommend optimal fasting insulin values below 5. We're kind of more strict on that definition. Remember that normal is a statistical term, it's the most common, and sometimes normal is not healthy. So how would you describe the Kraft Insulin Survey? Well, it lasts for at least 12 hours, measuring fasting glucose and insulin, drinking 100 grams of sugar solution. How do you call that, Dr. Okay. Glucola. And measuring glucose and insulin, and Dr. Kraft reported this way, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, up to five hours. So we're talking about seven draws, which can be difficult. So for patients that routinely go to get our labs, most of them go to their local Quest. We had to go through a lot of work for a couple of years to get Quest to do format that they currently do for us and when they do it correctly. And that is three draws, 
fasting one hour and two hours and 75 grams of glucose as opposed to 100. Yeah, and, and that's the difference between the insulin response and the Kraft insulin survey. As you see, the Kraft can provide more information, but it's, it's harder to be done for both the technician and the patient. And it takes five hours. Could we go back to that previous slide for a second? So you talked for a minute about fasting insulin. Uh, there's a lot of people that sort of lean a little bit academic that say HOMA IR is the real thing that you need. And that's a ratio between fasting glucose and fasting insulin. As you said, the bottom line is that does not work. You really need to stress the carb metabolism, your body's ability to do that. So when somebody tells you they got HOMA IR, or that that's the thing, be very afraid. They don't know what they're talking about. They're obviously not doing plenty of these tests, so they haven't seen what we've seen. Another thing while I'm talking about it is fasting glucose. You know, doctors these days will routinely say, we don't use fasting glucose, we use A1C. Well, if they actually did use A1C, that would be better than fasting glucose. But as we've said, the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists have agreed and said, that's not a great way to diagnose diabetes because it's a hemoglobin test. Back to the daily doctor and daily practice and the vast majority of diabetes when the diagnosis is made. If you look at the science, you look at the evidence, it's usually made with fasting glucose. Now, that says a couple of things. Typical docs don't do what they're saying. You know, doctors are like people. We think we're doing one thing when we're doing something else. And the other thing that it says is both are wrong. Now, when I say both are wrong, just using A1C or just using fasting insulin, both are wrong. And let me give you a couple of other facts from the science to help underline that. By the time the average diagnosis of diabetes is made, between one and two thirds of people already have damage to their eyes and over half of people already have some nerve damage. So what does that tell you? One thing it tells you is that even in a pre-diabetes phase, you can get injury to tissues. There's no question about that. The other thing that it tells you is we're making the diagnosis way too late. Why? Because we're waiting till it pops up on a fasting glucose that was gotten for some other reason. Had they actually done this test, we would be catching it much earlier and catching it before you get damage to eyes and nerves and arteries. So thank you for letting me go on that diet drive. It was necessary because we, we have seen plenty of examples of people who have acceptable levels of A1C, normal fasting glucose levels. And when we challenge them with the OGTT and insulin response, they are full blown diabetic and they just didn't know that. And they didn't wait, it expected that. And their recommendations, instead of saying, okay, let's do another test that can be more sensitive on identify diabetes before it starts causing trouble, the recommendation is, oh, when you have diabetes, go ahead and check your eyes when you're diagnosed because they already know that you will have damage already instead of focusing on detecting pre-diabetes and insulin resistance before that happens. Whenever you already have eye damage, most of that is really, really hard to get back from because that's nerve damage and nerves do not recover as easily as other parts of the body.